okay i think uh, it's better now okay so let us okay. start uh, today's uh, colloquium just few suggestions if you are not speaking then you can mute your microphone it will help and uh, so okay we are very pleased and happy we have uh, professor probin roy uh, from uh, bose institute salt lake campus with us for our institute colloquium today and uh, i don't think that uh, you know uh, professor probi roy needs any introduction for this audience but i can see uh, that there are some young people are also joining today for this uh, uh, colloquium so i would spend briefly few minutes to just introduce our speaker so professor probi roy one of the stalwarts of high energy physics in our country and also in abroad uh, we have uh, we have uh, we have been grown up um, seeing him listening him learning from him reading his papers his books and when i approached professor roy for this colloquium you know we can we should understand about his age and you know but he immediately agreed the enthusiasm he has for students and for all of us that okay yeah i am sure i am i am happy i will give a colloquium so we are thankful to you sir so just for a few words for uh, for professor probi roy uh, so he started uh, he uh, did his bsc from presidency college then ma from kings college phd from stanford and then you know he was uh, working at all possible big labs that you can imagine all over the globe and then he was he started working in tata institute and he worked there uh, and developed the high energy group there the phenomenology group there and uh, he received all the awards that one can think of being in india and also in abroad he uh, starting from shanti sharu bhatnagar prize fellow of all the academies meghnath shah lectureship award honorary scholar of kings college powell prize for best kings college student so there are many you know it will take like half an hour to uh, mention everything so with these words uh, i would like to request professor roy uh, that please tell us uh, about professor mure gelman and his own interaction with professor gelman and his contribution in particle physics and in general in high energy physics so i i hand over the mic to professor roy thank you sanjeev Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Very good. Yes, I am very happy to be uh, able to give this web-based colloquium and also an IANO seminar. Uh, but this is not strictly on a physics subject. It's a sort of remembrance of Professor Mare Gelman, whom I had the pleasure of knowing personally. Um. Uh, Professor Gelman uh, was a fellow, honorary fellow of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, where I had worked, and I also met him at CERN. The first time I was at CERN, we had neighboring offices, so for many months we were beside each other, and we used to sometimes meet for lunch. I, his, the person who was post, who was a postdoc with him, uh, Harold Fritsch, who is now a professor at Munich, uh, was a very good friend of mine. so three of us would have lunch uh, and chat on physics as well as physics related subjects and so forth so this is a very good occasion for me to remember uh, mare gelman now mare gelman of course is a great physicist and he had the unique uh, uh, distinction of getting a solo nobel prize you know in physics normally people share nobel prizes but he was given the Single Nobel Prize in Physics in 1969. I'll come to that. But apart from being a physicist, he was a person. He was really a polymath, a person of 
many interests and uh, many uh, occupations also. So I'll come to all that. I'll try to project, project to you a kind of survey of his life and of his work and of his thoughts and achievements and with, with many stories, anecdotes and so forth. So let's start. OK. So this is a photo of him taken uh, during his Middle Ages. He was born in 1929 in Manhattan. His father was a first generation immigrant. And he passed away in two, 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 2018 at the Santa Fe Institute, which he had co-founded with um, a condensed matter physicist. Well, come to that. And um, this, of course, towards the end, he was looking very different with white hair and everything. But I thought I would present this picture, where he looks sort of composed and happy. OK. so. He was actually born in a family of Jewish immigrants, originally from the Ukraine. I mean, his father, his parents rather, had uh, emigrated from the Ukraine. Now, the original name of the family was Helmon. Now, let me show you something. This. Can you see this? Okay. Can you see this uh, writing? This is Helmon. Can you see it? So, uh, yeah, just a little bit up. Still not visible. Uh, yeah, now a little bit more up, uh, like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you see it now? Yeah, a little bit towards. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now it is visible. Yeah. Now, if you see, if you saw it, note that the first letter is capital gamma in the Greek alphabet, but this is in the Cyrillic alphabet. Now, in the Cyrillic alphabet, the capital gamma letter is pronounced differently in different countries. See, both Russia and the Ukraine, they, uh, they write their languages, Russian and Ukrainian, in the Cyrillic language, in the Cyrillic script, rather. But this letter is pronounced her in Ukrainian, but g in Russian. Now, Russia had conquered, invaded, and occupied Ukraine for centuries during the Middle Ages. So during this time, the name, uh, they began to pronounce it as Gelman. And it was one word, actually, with no hyphen. So it became Gelman. So in English, in the Latin uh, alphabet script, they, they began to write it with capital G. And when his father, when Moray's father immigrated, to New York at the New York port, the immigration officer looked at his name, Gelman, and with a hyphen, with, without a hyphen, with a small m. He said, "Oh, this is too long," and he put a hyphen and, and a capital M. So that's how his name became Gelman. Now, <clears throat> Mona Gelman, right from childhood, was very, very interested in entomology and the origin of words how different words originated and so forth. Just to give an example, what you know to be the W boson, the, uh, uh, the carrier of the charged quantum of weak interaction. Originally, Gelman had thought of it in another model, which turned out to be incorrect. This was before the uh, weinberg saddam theory. And he called it X, because X boson, because the X is from the word ux in the Mayan language. A Maya civilization of Central America, Guatemala, Southern Mexico, was a very famous and advanced civilization. And the word ux in Mayan means soul. So Gelman Mare thought that this quantum, this particle, which was yet to be discovered, is the soul of weak interaction, which we call the ux boson. But Weinberg and Salam 
called it the W boson and caught on. Everybody called it the W boson. But he was unrelenting in relenting. He would always write in all his papers, instead of the W boson, the X boson. So the, his collaborators would write W in bracket, just to explain. And in journals, referees would change it to W. So he got so mad, for example, PRL, he said he wouldn't publish in PRL at all. So you know he had that kind of a strong view. Now, the first time I met him, this was in the autumn of 1971. I was a visiting junior scientist at CERN, and uh, Murray Gelman had the office next door. And Harold Fritch, my friend, introduced us. And when I explained to him, and when I told him my name, uh, Probi Roy, he said, ah, but your name Roy. It's really originally Rai in Bengali, isn't it? I was astounded because some of my non-Bengali Indian friends even know the origin of that. So I said, yes, it was anglicized to Roy. So you see, that was the, I said, you seem to know a lot about Bengali names. So he told me a story. And the story goes as follows. See, in Caltech, Richard Feynman was giving a seminar. Now, while talking about something, he wanted to talk about both condensation. Now, in America, especially in those days, not less nowadays, a lot of people pronounce Bose as Bose. So Feynman said, Bose condensation. German immediately stood up and said, oh, no, it's not Bose. You see, the original Bengali name is Boshu. Now, wow. it is transliterated sometimes as Basu, sometimes as Bose. And since he wrote on the paper his name as S and Bose, you should be called Bose condensation. Now, well, Feynman was not even aware that Bose was Indian. You see, many people in, in those days especially used to think that since Bose wrote, the paper was forwarded by Einstein and appeared in yeah. JavaScript of Physics, he Bose may be German. Now, Bose could be is a German sounding name. So you see, that was the, that's the kind of knowledge he had of words and names. Now, most of you must have heard of the physicist Roman Jakif. He calls himself Jakif. So when Kelman first met him, he told Jakif, hey, you are a guy who pronoun mispronounces his own name. So Jakif was uh, flabbergasted. He said, what do you mean? Said, you see, this is the Polish Yatsky, and you're calling yourself Jakif. That's not allowed. See, he knew all names in detail. Now, when Gelman uh, had become reasonably famous, he used to be called to Washington, D.C. to interact with the U.S. administration for sub-science policy and so forth. And in that capacity, he came in contact with the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Henry Pipes. So he met Pipes and he said, why do you mispronounce your name? This is the Hungarian Pipes. You should call yourself Pipes. Pipes was absolutely astounded, in fact. So see, this is the kind of, uh, how, how do I go to the next? Sorry. Yeah. Anyone? Oh, that. Hey. OK, fine. Thank you. So he was really a polymath. And he had many interests. Particle physics, of course, was his main interest. And he was very much interested in evolution of languages, specifically names. Then he was interested in archaeology, contributed to that, natural history, complex adaptive systems, biocultural mm -hmm. evolution of mankind, and also the process of learning. Now, all this is too much. I can't cover all of that. In fact, even one of them, if I want to cover in detail, it would be too too long. So I'll cover, I'll only talk about three aspects of his interests: particle physics, and evolution of languages, names, which I have already mentioned a little bit, and then complex adaptive systems. Now, a brief, some brief statements about Murray Gelman's education. He went to the Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School and um, high school and uh, graduated from there. Then he was an undergraduate at Yale University and got his AB degree, which is the standard American undergraduate degree in 1948. Then he was a graduate student in MIT under Vicky Weisskopf, and he finished his PhD in three years in 1951. Now, after that, he was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and then an assistant professor for two years at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and uh, for three years an associate professor 
1954 to 55, sorry, for two years uh, in, at the University of Chicago. After that, Caltech offered him the Robert Andrews Millikan Professor, which is already quite famous. So from 1955 to 93, he had been there and he worked, worked as a colleague of Richard Feynman and people like that. Uh, uh, and then in 1993, he left Caltech and he was already at the Santa Fe Institute, which he had co founded, uh, as I told you, and a distinguished fellow there. And from 1984, he was there, but from 93, he was there full time, except that he had also been made a director of the John D. Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And he, in that capacity, he served till his demise. Now, he, of course, received major honors. He got the Danny Heinemann Prize in Mathematical Physics in 1959, the Ernesto Lawrence Memorial Award in 1966, the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1969, just the solo Nobel Prize, the Ethora Maharana Science for Five Peace Prize in 1989, the Albert Einstein Medal in 2005. He was also a fellow and foreign fellow of numerous national, national academies, like the US National Academy of Sciences and Societies, for instance, he was a foreign fellow of the Royal Society and so forth. Okay, let me now come to his particle physics contribution, which are too many fold to describe in totality, I'll just mention a few. 1952-53, uh, when he was a postdoc, he did a very well-cited work on dispersion relations. You know, if you have two particles scattering into two particles, there are two particles of momenta P and Q scattering into P prime and Q prime. Of course, four momentum conservation tells you P plus Q equals P prime plus Q prime. Now, the scattering amplitude has certain analyticity properties in the PQ complex planes. And in this complex plane, you can write certain relations called dispersion relations. And with Goldberger, Kroll, and Lowe, Gelman wrote down some forward dispersion relations and non-forward dispersion relations, which were very useful because people were then doing these scattering experiments, both at uh, the Berkeley Evertron at, and at CERN, and they were discovering all sorts of properties, cross-sections, differential cross-sections, angular distributions, etc., of pion nucleon scattering, nucleon nucleon scattering, etc. So these were very useful in correlating sets of data in those experiments. Then in 1954, he did something which made him world famous, and that is the renormalization group equation with Francis Lowe. Now, <clears throat> See, I'm not going to define what a renormalization group is. That is a group of renormalization parameters with infinitesimal parametric transformation. But uh, just let me give you a physical um, argument for those who are not familiar. Some of you are well familiar, so I'll not belabor the point. Uh, you see, if you have a three particle coupling, you know, um, three particle coupling. Okay. OK, here, yeah. this three particle coupling uh, in the momentum plane, say, then this coupling strength, you, you, one can define a coupling strength G. Now, earlier, people used to think that G is a constant. But what they first realized that this is actually a function of the energy scale, which let us call it mu. I have not defined it, but one can define it in principle. And it varies with the energy scale. And this is the famous the real understanding on account of quantum loops. You see, at the quantum level, there are loops you have to take into account. When you do the renormalization of those loops, then you find that the effective coupling has become a function of the energy scale. Now, this is the origin of the famous statement that the fine structure coupling alpha, which is 1 over 137 at the atomic scale, becomes 1 over 128 at the electroweak unification scale of roughly 90 GeV or so. And then if you uh, further extrapolate it in theories uh, of grand unification, for instance, in the supersymmetric grand unification theory, this coupling strength becomes 1 over 16 at 2 times 10 to the 16 GeV. Uh, 1 over, yeah, 1 over 16. So this really all this, uh, we have written 
Regionalization group equation in modern notation. Can we move down a little bit? Uh, this one, no? This yeah. one, you want? Yeah. You can see this. No, can we? We can't see this line. He can't see. Oh. They can see. Yeah, they, yeah here. So, you see, the, the dependence of this coupling strength on the energy mass scale or energy scale mu is given by this equation. Mu d partial dd mu g mu is beta of g. Beta of g is a function. If this is actually in the modern Kalan semantic notation. Gelman and Lowe wrote it in a more complicated form, which is not used nowadays. This is the form which is used these days. And you can calculate this beta function order by order in perturbation theory. So for example, if the perturbation theory is convergent, as is the case in quantum electrodynamics, then you can calculate beta of E. In quantum chromodynamics, you can calculate beta of GS, the strong coupling strength, and so forth. So that was very useful. In fact, because of this, the fine structure coupling for strong interaction for QCD, alpha sub S, becomes a function of the energy scale. And uh, experimentalists at LEP specifically have measured this variation. It agrees with the perturbation theory, theoretic calculations in quantum chromodynamics. So that's a kind of fourth factor. Now we come to another famous work of Gelman with Nishijima in 1955. Water, please. Um, that, that's the Gelman Nishijima formula. Now, the Gelman Nishijima formula involve, uh, relates strangeness and baryon number and the third component of isospin to electric charge. See, these were the times <coughs> in the mid 50s when experiments at Berkeley and CERN were discovering all these strange particles the hyperons, lambda, sigma, cascade, etc. I'll come to that. And k mesons, etc. They were first discovered in cosmic rays and then studied in accelerators. And it was a puzzle because they, were, they looked rather random. Uh, they had random, seemed to have random properties. Now then, it was shown that sigma plus, that's the positively charged hyperon, has charge one in units of positron charge. It, there's a three component of isospin, sigma plus, sigma zero, sigma minus, baryon number one, strangeness plus one. And sorry, it should be strangeness minus one, that's a mistake. K zero has Q equals one, I three half, I three minus half, B equals zero, Change should be plus one. This is also this. And U quark, which we'll come to later on, has charge two third, isospin third component half, baryon number one third. Now they propose a linear formula. Q is I3 plus half B plus S. B is the baryon number, S is strangeness. For bosons, baryon number is zero. For baryons, it's one. For antibaryons, minus one. Strangeness is plus one, zero or minus one, plus two or minus two, depending on the situation. So let's go to the next stage. Oh, sorry, I haven't come to, okay. So with this, the, these hyperons and the k-mesons, they could be fit rather well. So people were very happy and they became very famous because of this. Okay, next we come to the V minus A theory. See, weak interactions which had been studied in beta radioactivity as well as stellar reactions that cause stars to shine. And that was sort of a puzzle. And then Fermi, around 1930, proposed that there is perhaps, um, uh, 1932, I should say, Pauli had already proposed the neutrino hypothesis, with which all of you are familiar. And Fermi proposed that perhaps the Hamiltonian can be written as a constant known as the Fermi constant, g of root 2, jw dagger, JW. There should be a mu here, a mu there, never mind. So JW is what like electromagnetic current, for we thought, psi bar gamma mu psi, that kind of current. Now, but then there was a puzzle. You see, the nucleus boron 12 has a beta radioactive decay to carbon 12, electron, and antineutrino. Now, it was known by nuclear physicists that both boron 12 and carbon 12 carry spin 1. 
Now, a vector current like the electromagnetic current, namely psi bar gamma mu psi, cannot take a spin one to spin one. That would violate the Wigner Eckert theorem. So, obviously, you can't have just the, you can have a vector current, but along with that, there must be scalar, pseudo scalar, axial vector, tensor, such currents. Now, there was a complete bewilderment. Uh, people were trying to fit various data on beta decay. See, beta decay, the electron spectrum is continuous. So one knew that there is electron neutrino and proton and neutron. So those, the currents were between them. And Sudarshan and Marshak in 1956 actually proposed, the idea came to Marsh, Sudarshan, he discussed with Marshak, he was a student of Marshak at Rochester. And they proposed the V minus A theory, a beautiful symmetry argument. I'll tell you what the symmetry argument was. See, the, the current was supposed to be between neutrino and electron, and the neutrino for all practical purposes to people seemed massless. It didn't seem to have any mass. So uh, they, Sudarshan had the idea that maybe the neutrino has a chirality transformation. Namely, if you take a neutrino to e to the i alpha gamma phi neutrino, maybe I should write it down here. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. It all one. Yeah. Can you see it? Can you people see it? So this is the transformation that Sudarshan posed. And if you make this transformation and demand that the Hamiltonian be invariant under this transformation, then you get the V minus A theory. It's a very beautiful argument, actually. And um, so, they said, said that the Hamilton, uh, Hamiltonian G minus A theory was proposed by Sudarshan and Marshall, but published by Feynman and Gilbert. Now, let me end this story, this part of the story, with a little irony. You see, now we know that neutrinos have masses. Now, of course, we are not sure that the electron neutrino has a mass. It could be massless. But if the neutrino has a mass, Maharana, Dirac, whatever, however tiny, then it can't obey the Weyl equation. So the Feynman argument is destroyed, but Sudarshan's argument about the chirality invariant still holds. So you see, in that sense, I always talk about the V minus A theory of Marsh, Sudarshan and Marsha. That's, I think, the most fair thing to do. Okay. Now, after this comes the famous, the eightfold way. Now, those of you who are familiar with Buddhism, know that Buddha had proposed Ashtamarga, the Eightfold Way. The Ashtamarga, the Eightfold Virtues are right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right concentration, right mindfulness. And if a person through sadhana can achieve all of this, that person will have arhat which is perfection. And Ashtamarga is the way to our heart, that is, to perfection. Now, Gelman, and independently Yuval Niman, of course, Gelman knew about Buddha's Ashtamarga, and he called it the Eightfold Way. Niman just proposed it as a mathematical thing. In 1961, you see, these the mesons and baryons, strange and non-strange, they are forming a puzzle, because their masses were different, their strangenesses different, their charges different, how to put them in a pattern. So if you plot, if you just plot the mesons as dots in the charge strangeness plane, then you get figures like this. So these are the baryons of spin half and mesons of spin zero. Now, you see the baryons are, you have the neutron and the proton, they have strangeness zero. Proton is charged, charge goes this way. Then this hyperon sigma, sigma minus, sigma zero, sigma plus, isospin or triplet. And then the hyperon lambda zero, 
this is also a strange minus one, but that's an isoprene singlet. Then you have the cascade minus and the cascade zero. They have charge strange minus two and charge minus and zero. So you see, if you think of a linear relation between strangeness and charge, then you can fit all this in an octet. See, eight. And this is the eighth, eighth and the first member. I mean, we have two, this is the isospin, the neutral component of the isospin and the eighth member come together. And the same, forget about the eta prime. Right? That's not relevant to the present discussion. So we have meson and baryon octet. So that really made them quite famous. But in fact, it turns out that you can also have baryons of spin three half and they come fall into a, what is called a decuplet, a 12 fold thing. So that's all, that's also something they proposed. And well, I, have, I don't have that figure here. And there was one thing missing. By the way, the masses here for the baryon especially are linearly related, the mass splittings. So in the decoplet also, there was, a, there was a missing member called omega minus, which has strangeness minus three, and they predicted it, and it was found at Brookhaven after a couple of years. So that made Gelman and Neiman very, very famous. And it led to a revolution in the study of hadrons, which is strong interacting particles. And this is the real reason that Gelman was given the Nobel Prize in 1969. Some people think, uh, Neiman should have been included, but that's a matter of opinion. Because Gelman had other contributions of note. Now, the puzzle that people had was that this octet of the eight dimensional representation, or the decuplet for that matter, these are higher dimensional representations of the group SU3. That's the Lie group of uh, unitary matrices three by three of determinant plus one. But the fundamental representations they are complex representations. By the way, the octet is a um, is a real representation. It's Hermitian, so it's self-conjugate. But the fundamental there are two triplet and anti-triplet. Where are the objects belonging to the triplet and anti-triplet representations? Now, in 1964, Gelman, who was at Caltech and also talked about it, but he was visiting CERN at that time. And George Zweig, who was at Caltech, they independently proposed that maybe there are fractionally charged objects occurring in this isospin hypercharge plane. Hypercharge, recall, is uh, baryon number plus strangeness. So you see, you have the triplet here in the I3Y plane. It's not the cursor is not coming. Oh, there. I3Y plane. Now you see, the D and the U are there, and S. These are the three quarks they propose. Down, up, that's an isospin doublet, and the singlet, which was they used to call sideways, but it was called strange later on, because it has strangeness minus one. And for the anti triplet, with the anti quarks, S bar, exact opposite, U bar and D bar. Now, Gelman called it quark, and there's a story many of you have heard, must have heard. You see, there is a book called Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. And there, there's a sentence, three quarks for Master Mark. Now, there's a further story behind that, which I found out from Howard Haber, which is my, who is my friend and quite a well-known American particle physicist. You see, James Joyce, when he was writing this book, Finnegan's Wake, was visiting Vienna. And he was staying in a hotel in Vienna. And in the morning, he woke up one day and he opened the window. Now, in Germany and Austria, that is in German speaking countries, there is a thing called quark, which is actually sour cheese. And some in those days, now, and nowadays you get it in the supermarkets. But in those days, there were vendors with carts on wheels, roll carts, pushing on the streets and selling them. The, the quark came in earthen pots. You know, it was yellowish in color. It was like, it's like, uh, you know, sour kind of yogurt, dahi. But it's, it's really different from dahi. I have taste, I didn't like it at all. But it's sort of in between cheese and dahi. It's a kind of sour cheese. So 
James Joyce opened the window and he saw this guy pushing this uh, roller cart and shouting quack, quack, quack. There are three pots on the top of this cart. And he immediately had this idea that, OK, we can write. He had this character Master Mark in Finnegan's way. And he said, three quarks for Master Mark. Gelman was a very erudite person, had studied uh, Finnegan's way. And he chose this name quark, which, after all, later has stuck. They are fictitious, but necessary fundamental constituents of all hadrons. Now, fictitious because nobody has seen a free quark. Nevertheless, as I'll explain to you, there is very strong evidence of the existence of quarks which are confined because of uh, which, which was strong interactions, the color nature of strong interactions. The quarks uh, have uh, potentials which rise linearly with distance and large distances. And so you need an infinite amount of work to separate two quarks. So they are confined into color. There are more general theorems one can prove. Well, I don't know, prove is the right word, that in a color uh, gauge theory, non abelian gauge theory, non singlets you cannot realize. You can only realize singlets. You may say, well, rotation group, you know, SO3, that's a non abelian uh, group theory. And you, we have vectors, scalars, tensors, but it's not a gauge theory. The statement is that if you have a non abelian gauge theory, then non singlets cannot be realized. They can only be confined. And quarks are non singlets, triplets, and triplets. So they cannot be realized. So that's a bit of a puzzle. How come quarks are not realized freely? How come they are permanently confined? And this puzzle can only be answered experimentally. And that was done by the slack experiments of 67, 68. I was a graduate student there. And in fact, I was right there when the experiment results were coming out. And it was such an exciting time. And we were all staying up nights and arguing among ourselves ferociously. Now, Richard Feynman was visiting Slack, and he was shown. He was, what they found is a generalized relativistic version of Rutherford scattering. Now, more, all of you know, I'm sure, that Rutherford discovered that if, when he scattered electrons from ions or atoms, there was backward scattering, large, and that told him that there were point-like electrons inside the atom. Now, what the slack experimentalists did was to scatter, to have deep inelastic and electrons scattered at large angles, and the proton was excited into a bunch of hadrons, all of which were summed over. And now, if you go to the center of mass system of this, then it's like a backward scattering of the electron. And they found large cross sections. And Feynman immediately said, it has to be because there must be particles inside. He called them partons. And for a long time, people were, even now, partons are used in uh, quark and gluon distribution functions inside hadrons, but that's a separate story. Feynman didn't propose that they were quark, but Gelman, who was initially highly disbelieving of partons, he finally granted that there were these. And he said, oh, no, no, those are the quarks. Now, <clears throat> you see, a proton has three quarks, two U quarks and D quarks. But apart from that, these are highly interactive, confined, and they are emitting, as we'll explain, gluons, et cetera. There are anti-quark quark pairs, clouds, and et cetera. So apart from these three quarks, which are the main constituent called the valence quarks, there's a cloud called the C of quark anti-quark pairs, which is a singlet, color singlet, an isospin singlet. And you may ask, how come the quarks are inside and by deep in that, because after all, Rutherford uh, deduced electrons inside atoms by uh, backward scattering. But electrons we can see. It uh, comes out. Quarks we do not see. So what is this? So the, the analogy I can think of is like this. See, just think of a glass bowl, spherical. Inside, there are three coins. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Now. You can see the three coins inside. You can shake and feel the three coins inside. But the coins cannot come out because there is a wall. So the proton has three quarks, U, D, uh, two U's and D's, and neutron has two D's and U. Like these, like three, think of them like. Now you may say, aha, but I can see them. I can see that 
But here also, what is seen? There's a photon which comes from a source, scatters from there and comes to your eye. Now, what the experimentalists have done, they have scattered electrons. And since the electrons are scattering in a backward direction, you know, there's something like that. The quarks are inside, they are linked by gluons, and they are emitting, it's a relativistic system. They're emitting QQ bar pairs, that's a cloud, and that's how it is. Okay. So now we come to quantum chromodynamics, which was proposed by Fritz Gelman and Lloyd Wheeler in 1973. Now, in 1971, I was at CERN and talking to Gelman and Fritz, and they were talking excitedly about color gluons. There are all sorts of technical problems, and I'll not really go into that, and I don't have very much time also. So in 73, they proposed with Lloyd Wheeler that really the underlying dynamics is a non-abelian color gauge theory based on the Lie group SU3, which is gauged. I'll not go into details of gauge transformations, gauge couplings, gauge functions, etc. But it, let me just it suffice it to say that there are three, just as in quantum dynamics, there's a single vertex, electron, photon, two electrons, one photon. In quantum chromodynamics, there are three fundamental vertices, a coupling of order G, quark, and gluon. Okay. And three gluons, the same coupling G, and four gluons with coupling G squared. And the quark, as I said, color triplet, gluon is octet, and because it's transformed like QQ bar, and anti quarks are color anti triplet. And many, many, as most of you know, many, many tests have been made, of course, perturbatively largely. But on the lattice also, it has been tested non perturbatively, and so far, it has withstood all experimental tests till today. And today it is acknowledged universally, more or less, as the theory of strong interactions. So that's more or less uh, all I'm going to say about Gelman's particle physics. And of course, he had many other contributions, but I don't have time to say. And um, you see, some many physicists essentially have stopped doing great physics after the Nobel Prize, because the Nobel Prize you know, sometimes uh, people think, oh, this is the finality. After this, I don't do it very much. But look, Gelman was not like that. He got the Nobel Prize in 67, and uh, he had proposed that partons were quarks and gluons, and proposed quantum chromodynamics with Fritch and Lloyd Wheeler in 1973. Okay, let me now come to his contributions to complexity. Now, <clears throat> We in physics, physics we have simple systems like quarks, like gluons, like electrons, photons, etc. And you can also have complex systems like many atoms, molecules, solids, quark gluon plasma, etc. Heavy ions, etc. Colliding, which also our colleagues are studying. Now Gelman was highly motivated uh, by this quotation from Arthur Ze, which is who is a Chinese American poet. I don't have the original Chinese here, so let me give you the English translation. They had had heard about the quark, and he had seen a jaguar in the forests of Guatemala. The jaguar, before it jumps on the prey, circles it, and usually it happens at night. So they wrote, the world of the quark has everything to do with a jaguar circling in the night. Now, the quark is simplicity. That's the elementary constituent. Jaguar is a complex system. So there must be some relationship between the simple and the complex. And this is what motivated Murray Gilmore. Now, he being an entomology, etymologist, he had uh, studied the origin of words. The word simplicity comes from the Greek once folded. You see, plik in Greek means fold. And simplicity comes from this plik means once folded. Whereas the word complexity comes from the word plex, which is actually an Indo-European, of Indo-European origin, it means braid. And complexity comes from braided together. So you see, once folded is simple, but many, if you have many um, folds, then you get a braid, and that's complex. So quark is a simple unit of matter, whereas jaguar is a complex adaptive system, adopts moves this way, moves that way, crouches, relaxes. And you can't give a clear analytical description. So 
what is the relation between these? Now, Walter Kuhn, a very famous congressman, as we also a Nobel laureate, he had also been thinking about computer because he came from the complex system side, and he was also thinking about and Gelman and Walter Kuhn were together in Aspen one summer. Aspen is a place where physicists visit in summer. I've also been there one summer to talk about physics in the very beautiful natural environment. And they said that why don't we found an institute which will investigate the relationship between the simple and the complex. So the major topic of investigation at the Santa Fe Institute, which was founded in 1984, co-founders were Maria Gelman and Walter Kuhn, uh, just is the major topic is complexity and the relationship between simple and complex systems. And Gelman played a leading role, along also Walter Kuhn there. Now, let me uh, talk, I don't want to go into, I, I'm not competent to go in details into complexity and complex behavior and so forth. Let me try to give you a very simple overview. A complex adaptive system acquires information from its interactions with its environment. It identifies regularities. You know, it, it, it interacts with the environment, it gleans regularities and, and identifies and collects them and forms a kind of schema. It's called a schema by the people working on a model. It's a technical term for a model, a schema. So it is this schema which is related to the fundamental laws. That's what Gelman uh, thought. So you, see, you have, you start with some previous data. How does one get rid of this black thing? Sorry? Get rid of this thing. Oh, you have to just keep it some time. Okay. But, but they can you start with previous data, including behavior and its effects. Then you examine that. You identify regularities and compression, and then you form a schema from these regularities and, and compression. Now, then you look at present data all around you. Previous data are other workers, data recorded by other workers earlier. Then you feel fold in the present data, you now unfold it in the context of, of these, uh, this schema. And then this you modify the schema and then you predict its consequences. And then these consequences, study the effect of these consequences, uh, how they affect various parameters, various other effects, how they result in observable objects and so forth. So this way you get a schema. Now you change the parameters a little bit and redo this analysis, you get another schema. In this way, by repeating such things, you get a collection of schema, and that's called a schemata. So once you have this schemata, you are able to study complex. Well, here's a very complex adaptive system. You know Frisbee, the America is very popular in America, but now it's also catching on in other countries in India. You have this plastic type of thin disc, you throw like this. Sorry, they can't see me. No, they can't, they can't see they, you throw it and and the dog jumps up and catches it in its mouth. So you see, that's something. How is it? This obviously a consequence of Newton's laws, but they are complex behavior. And Newton's laws are simple. The three laws of Newton are very, very simple. So starting with that, how do you understand this complex behavior? That's what these guys do. And Gelman was an inspiration to that. So Gelman uh, used to go to Guatemala and travel in the forest in Guatemala. One day, he was, he told, he had told me, yeah, I, I also met Gilman in 1980, and later he had visited Tata Institute and we chatted. He was caught uh, after dark, and he saw a jaguar, a black jaguar, like a panther, and you could see its eyes glowing in the dark. So here's a picture of the jaguar, which is about to crouch, you know, about to jump on its prey, on a crouch. Now, when the jaguar jumps, that's a complex adaptive behavior. And once again, you need to have a complexity kind of analysis to relate it to simple biology, simple physics, and so forth. So this is the kind of thing that they do. Now, <clears throat> Gelman had applied this analysis to problems as diverse as deterministic chaos in money markets. <laughs> To the, to the issue of a child learning a language and bacteria developing drug resistance 
as well as in quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger's cat paradox, which many of you I probably know. And now I come to the main contribution to physics from this complexity analysis. That's a many world interpretation. As you, most of you must have heard, Einstein, Fogel, and Rosensky, Rosensky discovered that there is, there is a phenomenon of entanglement. And if you have an entangled system in quantum mechanics, then you can have situation where you have two objects which are which have a space-like coordinate. You know, they have their spin correlates. Let's say they have, they have spins, two atoms or something. To, and but they the spins are correlated, but they they are distant, distant spatial separation and temporal difference is such that they are space-like with respect. That is, suppose one is at four mu x one. X1 mu and the other is a four uh, coordinate X2 mu, X1 minus X2 whole square is less than zero. Then how is how does this correlation come? This quantum mechanics, the standard quantum mechanics, the which we call the Copenhagen school, the Bohr kind of interpretation, they are just silent. There is such a space like correlation, and indeed experimentally it's been found. Entangled systems have been found, and people have found entanglement over distances of uh, 200 kilometers now in Long Island, New York, from Brookhaven. So it's a fact. But how do you understand it? And to understand that, uh, Gelman and Hartle proposed the many world interpretation that when you make a measurement, you just collapse into a single world, and there are many worlds, and this correlation they are able to explain. Whether one accepts it or not is a separate issue, but I don't want to go into the details of that. So I think I have come to the end of my talk. Um, I think the Gelman's vision of the world <coughs> can be su summed up by the last sentence of his book. Let me go back to the previous page um, here. See, he wrote a book called The Quark and the Jaguar. And this book I have read, and the last sentence of this book sums up his vision of the most desirable world. A sustainable world is one in which humanity as a whole and the rest of nature operate as a complex adaptive system to a much greater degree than they do now. With, these, with this sentence, Gelmond finished the book, The Quark and the Jaguar, and I, with this statement, I also finish my talk and I'll take some questions. Thank you. So thanks a lot, sir, uh, for your this inspiring talk. It was like a uh, Tagore's uh, short stories, or like melodious music that you don't want that it should be stopped. I would like to just say that you know one of the short stories by Tagore uh, that antore aptripti rabe shango kore mone hobe shesh hoyo hoylo na shesh. So it, it is like you know uh, you know we should keep on listening these things and you know, discuss and, uh, you know, learn. So thanks a lot that, you know, not at all. Pleasure. Personally, personally, I must admit that I was not aware of all these stories. So telling us, taking us in the past. So now the forum is open for questions. Uh, I would like to request uh, my colleagues, students, uh, you know, if they have any question or they want to start any discussion. So the forum is open. So Can please, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, very good. So I request uh, all of really. you one. So should, should I? Uh, hello, uh, this is Ajit. Yes, yes. Ajit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, definitely a very beautiful talk. A very inspiring Thank and you. amazing story. I mean. I, as I, Sanjeev said, even I didn't know most of his story. So it's beautiful. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for this. A uh, uh, couple of questions. One thing is just that uh, this, I, I got confused. That, uh, uh, this uh, mini world interpretation I thought originates from uh, superposition principle. Entanglement. Mini world. Yeah. This, only, this yeah. only handles the superposition, not entanglement. Isn't that right? I am really an, or not an authority on this subject. I, I have okay. to ask my colleague uh, Deepankar Home. For that, he is an authority. I am not, but no, I, 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 I yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. It explains the superposition principle, but I thought uh, you can also understand entanglement. But I may be wrong. 
Uh, I'm not it, really an expert. Okay. So. Entanglement actually is only handled by David Bohm's pilot wave theory, as I understand. Yes, but so hidden, it, hidden, hidden variables have not yet been found, as you know. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, David Bohm's pilot wave theory, not hidden variables. Yes. It no, there is a, I'm told by my colleague, ex colleague, Professor Sharanko Roy, that right. there is a version of the hidden variable theory which agrees mm -hmm. with all predictions of quantum mechanics. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. I see. Non-local. That is a non-local. Yeah, it is a non-local theory. Yeah, non-local. Entanglement is a non-local phenomenon. Yeah, of course. I think on that there is general agreement. Right, right. No question. Yes. So, so the questions are about your. Um, one thing I have been always been puzzled with uh, this uh, eightfold way. Uh, yes. The most remarkable application of symmetry principles to the physics. First, most remarkable, I would think. Uh, yes. When these uh, uh, Neumann and Gelman. Uh, identified Neumann and Gilman, yes. Neum uh, Gilman, yes. Uh, when they identified these uh, uh, diagrams as uh, root diagrams of SU3 group, oh. SUT flavor group, yeah. these uh, these diagrams were present earlier, or they were the first people to even plot such a diagram. They identified no. it as SU3 root diagram. No, they were the first people to plot them in the I3Y plane, uh, uh -huh. isosceles and hypercharge. But mathematicians knew about them for a long time. You see, so they knew the root, yeah. They, they, knew the said, they knew about octets, they knew about breaking Lie sure. group invariance, and if you break a Lie group invariance, then you get these um, uh, split multiplets and so on. In a mathematical way, in basis in terms of basis states and so on, they knew about all these things. So I understand they, root diagrams were known. So these yeah, were root diagrams. Before Gelman and people, nobody even ever plotted any of these quantum numbers on two axes. No. Uh, no, no, that's not strictly true. Gelman and Nishijima, when they proposed the Gelman Nishijima formula, right. they had already started these plots on I3Y plane. But at that time, other uh, strange baryons and so on had not been discovered. Okay, so okay. this was 1956 or something, I think. So okay. this was somewhat uh, precursor to that. So the plot okay. basically is Gelman Nishijima idea. And Gelman and Neiman simply made these plots with more data, with more modern data and so on. And that's how they came to the octet. And the connection to uh, Osterberg is Gelman's philosophy. Yeah, sure, I understand. So actually, so without change quark, the diagrams were so simple. SU2 root diagram that they could, one could not identify any structure. SU3, you mean? No, without change quark. Yeah, Gelman and Nishijima had SU2. Yes, yeah, yes, SU2 right. is not rich enough to show any pattern, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, simple they lines. only had simple, uh, they, they had only strange and non strange, that's all. Okay, okay, okay. You're right. Uh, and the last question I have is about this. Uh, so, this institute with um, um, Gelman and, and Watercone uh, uh, founded, uh, I, I hope I'm not misinterpreting, but it sort of gave an impression as if they had a reductionist approach. Uh, I am that, not really. I have visited the institute. There was a conference in Santa Fe, which I attended, and they invited me. I visited there, but I am not whether reductionism or anti-reductionism. That part I am not competent. No, so I know nothing about the institute. I am just listening from your talk. Well, they are. It's a. It's an institute dedicated to the study of mainly complexity phenomenon. They apply it to economics, to finance, to uh, adaptive behavior, sociology, language. All sorts of things. Now about the about the uh, the uh, debate between reductionism and emergence. You see, condensed yeah. matter physics, many body science is emergence, yeah. whereas uh, yeah. particle physics has been accused of reductionism. So this part, I what they are doing, the philosophy part, I am not aware of. I'm just wondering because Phil Anderson would never try to explain a complex behavior in terms of simple. Would simply not. I know, to. but that's his. He's a great, great guy. He's a great physicist, but that's his philosophy. Okay, sure. I okay. would live, try to live in a world in which the simple and the complex the uh, coexist. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Further questions, comments. Somebody wanted to know about integral quarks. Yes, uh, so please raise your hand uh, or ask the question. Uh, let me see the chat. Yeah, Swadashi asked, could you please light on integral type of quarks and their interaction mechanism? This is a question, sir, from one of the PhD students. Yes. Can you could ask you that? I would uh, yeah. request him to ask his question. 
So I can. Sir, hear. Yeah, I, I can repeat the question. His question. His okay. question is Could you please put light on integral type of quarks and their interaction mechanism? Okay. Now, I don't want to go into great detail. Integral quarks were proposed by Hahn and Nambu, and they, are vi they were viable at that point only if they have a non abelian quantum number which was called color. The idea of color is not due to Gelman. Hahn and Nambu already had it, but it's a different kind of color, not this co color. But anyway, let me not go into that. So they could also fit the hadronic data Hahn and Nambu had shown. But then they were not; they should not be confined, and they would be able, producible. So then they said, people said that maybe the production threshold is very high. They could, one could actually. I have worked on it with Professor Raj Shekharan, and we have several very well cited papers on that. We wrote down, and Pati and Salam also did it. They also, we, these two groups, myself and Raj Shekharan and Pati and Salam, independently worked out a theory of. You know, quantum chromodynamics with integrally charged quarks and gluons. And we took the view that the color threshold is very high. And there's an argument due to the late Professor Harry Lipkin of Weizmann Institute Israel that as long as the color threshold is very high, then below the threshold, all predictions of integrally charged quarks and fractionally charged quarks are identical. You cannot distinguish between them. Now, this turns out to be true only with single current induced reactions like electron uh, scattering, etc., so E plus E minus annihilation, where you have a single photon. But when you have more than a single current, like two currents, for example, you have deep inelastic Compton scattering, or you can have uh, E plus E minus annihilation in which more than uh, one photon, two photons are in. Then you can have virtual loops in which the predictions of integrally charged quarks and the fractionally charged quarks become different. And these predictions agree, the experimental data agree with fractionally charged quarks. And so now the integrally charged quarks are more or less being abundant. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other questions, uh, comments uh, from students? If they have any question, please. Uh, please feel free because we don't get these opportunities so often. So. Grab this opportunity if you have any question, comments. Uh, yes, don't be shy. Yes, uh, uh, sir. Uh, in the meantime, I I just want to ask few things. Um, so, yeah, you have to be louder, Sanjeev. Yeah, so I want to ask a few things. Uh, yeah, please, uh, sir. You mentioned about this running of coupling constants uh, yes. in the beginning, and you also mentioned this was one of the famous work by Professor Gelman. Uh, he suggested, yeah, with low. yeah. <laughs> sir, uh, I am asking that he first realized this in the context of weak interaction or electromagnetic no, no. interaction? Elec quantum electrodynamics. Okay. They wrote, okay. they only considered quantum electrodynamics. I read the paper. It's mm. a difficult paper, but it's uh, one can understand it. They considered, and in fact, Callan and Simonzik, who independently and wrote a much clearer and more beautiful paper, they also considered. Uh, quantum electron. In those days, the only good theory was quantum electronics, QED. And all model calculations, all new ideas, all new calculations, which are fundamental, people mm. only did started with QED. Because that's mm. something they understood. Perturbation theory was valid and so forth. Later on, these ideas have been generalized to QCD. But they originally, they were all done in QED. And uh, uh, okay, sir, in this case, this idea that you know this uh, coupling constant can vary uh, with energy. Uh, here, there was some experimental signature, or it is just like a, here the theory comes first. Like no, this is a case where theory came first. Gelman and Lowe, they were studying dispersion relations in the complex plane, and then they began to think, well, how do we know that? What happens when you do loop calculations? With the, and then when, it did, when they did loop calculations, then these renormalizations, constant dependence, and scale dependence was coming in. So they wanted to, because an observable quantity like cross section or angular distribution cannot depend on the renormalization scale. So then they realized there's a coupling which varies 
and then they reformulated it. So it was a purely theoretical uh, thing. They did not have any experimental hint or experimental foundation. And in fact, in quantum electrodynamics, it has not been experimentally verified because the coupling is so weak. Only as you know, in LEP was the uh, uh, variation with the external momentum scale or energy scale of the strong coupling was found because of the precision of the E plus E minus experiments. So and I must say, our colleague and friend Sunanda Banerjee played the leading role in that experiment. So, uh, so that means that uh, after his idea, people accepted it in case of weak interaction, strong interaction. No, no. And in those days, there was no theory of weak interactions. Right. You see, so B minus A was an effective theory. Mm -hmm. So these things began to be applied to quantum chromodynamics and weak interactions, etc. After 66, 67, you see, Gross and Wilczek and Politzer independently, because of which they got the Nobel Prize. They did the uh, renovation group calculation in, in non abelian gauge theories in 69, 70, uh, right. 71, mm -hmm. that kind of period. So oh, up right. till, until and unless the weinberg salam theory, because of the work of Etoft and Weltman, began to be accepted as a valid field theory, it was like an effective theory, Fermi theory, uh, uh, and then Lachau's uh, model, then weinberg salam theory, these were effective theories. You can't do loop calculations in those. So how could you study the innovation group there? Only in QED, it, it was a purely theoretical effort. There was no experimental correlation with the experiment at all. It is only when that this observation, this theoretical analysis extended to QCD by with the pioneering work of Gross, Wilczek, and Polizer and others that people worked out the variation in E plus E minus annihilation and the lay experiment to be observed. And one comment, sir, you know, so here theory wins. Uh, uh, similarly, another contribution of Gelman, this omega particle. Yeah, which, yeah uh, that's what I mentioned. Uh, right. That so, the, you have the, in SU3, mm -hmm. the, apart from octets, you also have the decuplet. Right. So the decuplet has cascade, I mean, cascade star, sigma star, etc., n star, uh, etc. I mean, so the decuplet, I didn't have the diagram, but the omega minus was missing. So they mm -hmm. predicted using perturbation theory, which they could apply to symmetry breaking forces, which are weak, that there would be omega minus, and that's what was discovered in Brookhaven. So that actually was played a key role in Gelman's 1969 Nobel Prize, because this had not been formulated by Neiman as much. Neiman had only concentrated on octets, but Gelman also Con considered the decuplet and pre predicted omega minus. So this discovery of omega minus was one of the main factor of giving him the sole Nobel Prize. Oh yes, right? absolutely. Not the only factor, but certainly a major factor. Sorry, sorry, we are just will come back. Yeah, uh, it was not the only factor, but it was the major factor. Okay, sure. sir. Okay. Oh. Uh, because you know, otherwise people might have just said, "Oh, this is all group theory." fancy mathematics, okay, mm -hmm. you can fit in a pattern, but how do you directly correl correlate with current experiment, etc. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so any, any, any further questions? Uh, or if comments? anybody would like to uh, ask me any question on confinement or... Right. Sir, there is, there, there is one comment uh, from one student from Aligarh Muslim University. Yeah. Uh, so let me read, sir, I don't have a question but I would like to make a comment. So I read an obituary on uh, Gelman in July 2019, CERN Courier. I was very inspired yeah. by his story and wanted to know more about him. Today I had an online viva, but I requested my professor to reschedule my slot to attend your lecture. Thank you very much for this beautiful story-like presentation. So okay, he, I'm he glad you liked it. Me. Look, if there is no other question, let me end this session with a story. Because you okay. like stories, right? Story yeah, like yeah, sure, sure, sir, and sure. this is a story related to Sanjeev's question about the running coupling strength. Okay. You see, Wolfgang Pauli. Now, there are many Pauli stories and <laughs> the hour will go by if I start telling all Pauli stories. <laughs> but let me tell you, Pauli was a very formidable person. Everybody was scared of him. You know, he, there was a time 
when he used to sit on all job committees in Europe. So anybody who got foul of Pauli had no chance of getting a job. Yang, for example, Yang never applied to a position in Europe because Yang and Lee proposed parity violation. That was the time when Yang did not have a tenure job. And Pauli frowned upon parity. Pauli disliked that because Pauli thought discrete symmetries like parity, charge conjugation, and time reversal in the they are part of the uh, extended Lorentz group and they should be exact symmetries of nature. So when parity violation was discovered and confirmed, Pauli got such a shock that he had a heart attack and died. <laughs> now you see that, that was the sort of strong opinion that Pauli had. Now let me tell you the story. After Pauli died, he went to heaven and he demanded an audience with God. He said he had a few questions to ask God. But he was told God is a very busy being, having to look after the entire cosmos. He had time for only one question. And Pauli asked God, why is the value of alpha equals 1, 1 over 137? And God said, it isn't. That's only true at q square equals 0. That quantity runs with q, with q square. So, and by the time you go to the electroweak unification scale at 190 GeV, or 90 GeV, it, because it has risen to 1 over 128. And if you extend it to the supersymmetric grand unification scale of 2 times 10 to the 16 GeV, its value has risen to 1 over 16. And Pauli asked God, why is the value of the unified coupling strength at uh, 2 times at the supersymmetric grand unification scale of 2 times 10 to the 16 GeV equal to 1 over 16? But he was told he had exhausted his one question, and God was the one that answered. fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, I think. Uh, can we say goodbye with that? Right, right, right. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, sir. Thank okay. you very much for well, your patience, for your talk. Talking to all of you. And we are very much grateful, the entire IOP family. Okay, for your time, precious time and sharing your uh, you know, experience with Gelman and nice stories. And we uh, look forward that in future also we will be having opportunities. I'll be happy to. To learn from you, sir. So thanks <coughs> a lot. Thanks a lot. And uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah.